so we are uh, we're still in the middle of our Acts, uh, our Acts of the Apostles series, and really trying to figure out what what can we learn from the early church that we need to recover or restore or dust off, you know, from the early church that we can do that in the modern church. So we we've been looking at different stories throughout the Book of Acts. It is not too late if you have not done this yet. I really hope that you will. We started off the summer encouraging you to do it. Read the Book of Acts. Read the whole thing, start to finish, and you can read it in you know little pieces and. Uh, you can read you know, one thing you know, from start to finish all the way through. Take notes. If you don't know something or don't, you have a question about it, write a note down. Talk, you know, talk to your spouse about it. Come ask me about it. Ask someone else that you trust about it. What, we wanted, what we're trying to do is just engage you with the scriptures. It just, it just helps everybody when you do that. It helps, it helps you. It helps you take next steps. There's going to be people in places you don't know where they are. They're ancient names. Many of them are like, I don't know where that is. You know, where's Ephesus? I don't know. Where you find it. Um, Google is a great tool. It'll it'll find you a map that shows you where all these some of these ancient places are. And so I hope that you'll do that. I hope before the summer's over, you will have read the book of Acts um, and not just kind of doing what we're doing in, in the service, but really supplementing that. This morning, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 18, and we're going to be uh, talking about a character, a person, right, named Apollos, who was a, a you know, a big, a big piece of what happened in, in the early church. We See him mentioned elsewhere in the in the book, Paul's uh, letter to the church at Corinth, but I want you. And this is kind of the first. This is the time we're introduced to him in the book of Acts, and and really just you know, there's some things I think we can learn from from the process that he goes through here as he as he kind of takes his next steps. Even though he's a very gifted person, uh, he takes his next steps in ministry, and so let's uh, let's look at God's word this morning and let's ask God. All right, God, what do you have to say to me? This is what it says in uh, Acts 18, verse 24 and following. It says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When uh, Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Now, Priscilla and Aquila, just as a side note, they are uh, contemporaries of Paul as well. They are uh, people who have been partnering with Paul in his ministry. Priscilla is a woman. These are not names that we use all the time, right? So Priscilla is a woman. Aquila is a man. So, uh, so Priscilla and Aquila, they teach him, they instruct him a little bit more thoroughly in the way of God, it says, more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there uh, to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously uh, refuted the, his Jewish opponents in public debate, praying from the scriptures, uh, pr- uh, that the, I'm sorry, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Will you pray with me? God, thanks for today, and I thank you for these friends, and I thank you for a time when we can gather uh, together. God, I pray uh, that you would teach us this morning. I pray that your word would continue to speak to us. God, I pray that you would either now use me and speak a word or speak a word in spite of me. Either way, God, I know these people didn't come to hear me talk. They came to hear a word from you, and that's what we're trusting, that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. And we pray these things, and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week in the Neely house, we had a water leak. Now, I, I, uh, this happened on Monday morning. Ginger had already gotten ready for the day. She put on a load of laundry and left for work, and I was still reading the paper and you know, getting ready to start going, uh, you know, get ready for the day. And I, I, I walked into our master bedroom uh, floor, and I realized I was uh, pretty much immediately standing in water. Now, I'm not all that smart. But I don't think that water is supposed to be on the floor of your master bedroom. And I'm not even sure, you know, where the pipes would be. And so I start looking around. I'm like, where? Like, is the pipe burst? Like, what's going on? I'm looking, has my hot water heater finally, you know, kicked the bucket? And it's, you know, leaked down through the ceiling and dripping somewhere. I looked around, there was nothing. So I said, okay, well, I'll keep walking. So I walked a little further into the master bathroom. And I realized that there's even more water on the floor of the master bathroom in our house. And then... I began to smell something. It didn't smell right. It didn't seem like the water I was standing in in my bare feet was clean water any longer. 
Friends at Parkway, if you've never stood barefooted in sewage, um, you're missing a special blessing. Just want to say that. You know, if you can just you watch the little shredded pieces of toilet paper float by your feet and get in between your toes, it's a great joy. You should try it sometime. And so I realized that something was not right. And I looked over, and in my shower, there's water in the shower. And now that sounds normal. There's supposed to be water in the shower. The problem was the shower wasn't running. And there was now water that was pouring over the edge of the shower from the laundry that was elsewhere, right? And so there was a stoppage somewhere, and it was pushing water up through. And then I looked over into the, uh, into the master bathtub, which is a whirlpool tub, which I will never, ever take a bath in ever again. And there was water in my bathtub all the way, probably six or eight inches up the side, you know, inside the bathtub. And I thought, this is not good. And I realized that we had a big problem. Now, I won't, I'll spare you the details of all that happened. There was a plumber called, and there's a home warranty company involved. And of course, they don't cover it because the home warranty companies never cover anything. And, and so, uh, and we found out that there's a stoppage in our, in our sewer lines outside of, our, outside of the foundation about three to four feet from the clean out in our, uh, in our front flower bed where I pr planted all those pr uh, pretty flowers for my wife on uh, Mother's Day. They're all gone now. Now, uh, so, what, so um, and, and we eventually got the stoppage taken care of, so I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm back in my house, and, you know, it's okay. But, um, but I'm, 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 I, I realized that this was not going to be a good thing. This actually, you may, if you've been here since I got here uh, or before I got here, you may remember I had only been at this church less than a month when uh, we had this exact same problem in the exact same place. And we had a plumber come out, and he was like, hey, it's going to be like $1,200 to fix this thing. I said, how much, of that is, how much of that is the digging cost? He said, about $700. I said, give me a shovel and come back on Monday. And so, uh, and so I dug that out, saved myself a bunch of money, and then nice enough, somebody in the church actually came and helped me do the repair and all that kind of stuff. Well, I got the same problem now. I got this thing and I'm digging it out. So I start to dig. Now he says it's three to four feet from the clean out. Let's put the picture up. So there's the clean out. There's a big pipe sticking out of the ground up there. And so I said three to four feet from the clean out. I'll start digging a hole right here, about three to four feet. And I said, how deep can that stupid pipe possibly be? It can't be more than 10 inches or 12 inches deep, right? Not right. I dug 8 inches, I dug 10 inches, I dug 12 inches, no pipe. I dug 14, 16, 18, 20 inches, no pipe. I dug 24 inches into the ground, there was no pipe, and now I'm getting nervous. Because I'm thinking, even though, I mean, he, he, this was my thought process. I got more energy than I got money. I'm in better shape than I was when I was 20, and I'm going to go ahead and just do this, right? Because I can save the money and do this. But when you're 24 inches deep now, and you're already exhausted, you're ready to quit, it's Texas in the summer, and, and, and you're ready to give up, and you realize you have not even yet found the pipe. That's not good. And so I, I phoned a friend. I called my friend Brad Greer. Now, Brad Greer, is in the, uh, he's in the uh, sprinkler business, right? Sprinkler system kind of business. So free plug for Brad Greer. I called Brad Greer. I said, you dig things. You know pipes and stuff. I know you're not a plumber, but Help me figure out what do I need to do. I've now dug a hole, and I can't find the pipe that's supposed to be there. I'm now like 30 inches deep. I have not found a pipe. He says, well, if I were you, I'd dig another hole. I'd dig a hole closer to the clean out, that top hole up there. He said, I'd dig a hole closer there because, you know, you'll have to dig less of a big hole. I thought, that's a really smart thing. Why didn't I think of that? So I dig a hole right there. And, and then I, you know, I dug, I had to dig like 35, 36 inches deep, and I finally found the pipe. And then I just followed the pipe, assuming it went out in a straight line, which it, thankfully it did. Um, it kind of went off a little bit to the end. And then, and then I dug down a little further in the main hole, and then I found the pipe. Now, I'm still not finished with this project, but there's a couple of things that I learned in the process. First thing I learned was I do not have the requisite knowledge to finish this job. That's why I had to phone a friend. And so I had to get someone who knows a little bit, a lot more than I do, and so he had to help me to do that. The other thing I've learned, which is what, besides exhaustion, is the other reason I have not finished this project, is I realized I didn't have all the right tools. I really need, a, I need an axe at this point. I need like a pick at some point here to, uh, to, you know, to you know, make this channel a little bigger. I'm going to have to channel next to the pipe. I mean, all this kind of stuff. I realized I needed a pick, and I need a different shovel, because that little, um, that sharpshooter shovel that I have, 
when you do it in a hole that's only this big, you can't actually get any dirt out. So I'm down here like throwing dirt over my shoulders. I'm like a dog digging in the dirt down here. And I realized I don't have all of the tools. So I don't have the right knowledge and I don't have the right tools. Now, thankfully, I had a friend I could call and somebody's already offered to let me borrow a pick. So I'm, I'm good for this afternoon. You'll know where I'll be. The deal is, if you've ever felt like this, if you've ever started a project and realized you didn't have all the knowledge that you needed, if you've ever started a project and you realize you didn't have all the tools that you needed, then you sort of understand where Apollos is in this process. See, Apollos, is a, he's a Jewish convert to Christianity. He's in the town of Ephesus, and he's got some gifts. I mean, this is a guy who's naturally gifted. He is fervent. He, is, uh, he has a lot of energy. He is well-versed in the scriptures, and he's knowledgeable. It says that he's teaching about Jesus. His teaching about Jesus is accurate, right? He's teaching about Jesus accurately, and he's doing some really good stuff. But there's a hole in his game. What it says here in this scripture was that um, that he only knew, it says he only knew the baptism of John. Now, just some background on that. The baptism of John that we see in the Gospels, the baptism of John is a baptism of repentance. This is John the Baptist, right? And he comes before Jesus is really on the scene, and he, he calls people to repent and to be baptized, and they are. And so there's, you, you, there's this differentiation in the New Testament between the uh, a baptism of repentance and then the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus talks about. Even here in the first chapter of the book of Acts, he says, hey, you know, John baptized for repentance, but you're going under, to undergo, you're going to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, so there's these two different baptisms. And so really what interpreters tend to look at is that, is that Apollos, the hole in his game is that he has an insufficient understanding of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he only knows that this, this baptism of repentance, that was part of the story. It was a good part of the story. It was an important part of the story, but he didn't know the whole story. And so Priscilla... And Aquila, after they heard him teach, they heard the hole in his game, and they took him aside, and they said, hey, come to our house, let's have dinner. And they come over, he, he comes over to their house, and, he begin, and, and they begin to explain to him, it says, the way of God more adequately. They basically filled out his knowledge. They told him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They told him about who the Holy Spirit was and, and who God was, the triune, you know, like this, you know, this whole thing, right? They, 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 they explained more adequately what, what was going on. He had some gifts. He was operating out of his gifts, but he, he wasn't operating out of the knowledge and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so here come Priscilla and Aquila, and they come alongside of him, and they help him. And this must have gone well, because after this, it says that he wants to go on to Achaia, if you, if you remember. And it says that the, the believers there in Ephesus sent with him a letter saying to other churches that he would go to, hey, this, is a, this guy knows what he's talking about. You should listen to him. All right? So that's what they, that's what they do. So so, so uh, Apollos has his, his game is more well-rounded, and then they send him forth with their blessing to go instruct other believers. Now, friends, this is one of those moments. He, he, uh, we, we don't know that Apollos saw this gap in his, in, his, you know, in his own game. He didn't see this hole in his own game. Somebody actually had to come alongside of him and say, hey, I just want you to know that you've got part of the information, but you need the rest of the information. But whatever the process was, he realized he had a hole in his game, and he was willing, and they were willing to help him, and he was willing to receive their help. And that's really important. Friends, we know all about filling holes in our game, don't we? I mean, that, this is something that happens. Uh, we all have holes in our game as husbands and wives, and holes in our game as friends, and we have holes in our game uh, as parents and as co-workers, and all that kind of stuff, right? We all have flaws. We all have empty spaces. We have blind spots that we don't even know that we're not doing something right, and sometimes we see it, and sometimes somebody has to come alongside of us and put their arm around us and say, hey, come with me, let me show you a better way. That's what happens here. This happens all the time, right? You guys remember, some of you might have heard of a, 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 of a little short guy named Akim Olajuwon. You know who I'm talking about, right? I'm calling him Akim because it wasn't until a few years later that he changed his name back to Hakim in like 1991 or so. But when he first, and some of you were here, he probably went to U of H during the Phi Slamma Jamma era and all that stuff. When Akim Olajuwon came into the NBA, he was, he was drafted by the Rockets. He was a very good player. He was a raw, you know, just incredible physical specimen. This is a guy who could who could do a lot of things. He played defense. He was aggressive. He was good around the hoop and all that stuff. A lot of good things, but he wasn't yet an elite player. Now, from the moment that he came into the league, the Rockets got better. Their win total went up by like 15, 20 games the next year just because they had him on their team. 
So he was very good. And that happened for a couple years in a row. They, had, they got much better. But then there were a couple years where they actually got worse again. And about 1991, about the same time he changed his name back to Hakeem Olajuwon, he, he, I, and I don't know if somebody told him about these holes in his game or maybe he noticed them himself, but, but what he started to do was work on two things. And the most important two things that he worked on that made him better was he worked on his footwork, right? The thing that we eventually uh, have become to, to call the, the dream shake, right? This thing that became his signature move, the thing that made uh, opposing defenders look silly because he could shake them off by the footwork. And he was great with this kind of, whether he was facing the basket or he had his back to the basket, he could do this fadeaway jumper. It was, it, he, became, he became elite because he did work on his footwork and he, he, he created this thing that we now call the dream shake. The other thing he learned how to do was pass in the post. So if he got his if he got the ball and he's getting double teamed or triple teamed, he made he learned how to distribute the ball to other teammates, which made them better and made him better and made their team better. He, they beca- he went from being a very good player to an elite player to an MVP player to a Finals MVP player to leading the Rockets to their first two uh, championships ever and to a first ballot Hall of Famer because he saw holes in his game and he filled the holes. Some would say we're seeing the same thing with James Harden these last few years, right? He went from being the best sixth man on uh, an Oklahoma City team, and now he is a, a perennial MVP. He's even got better on his defense, some would say. Nobody? Nobody would say that? Okay, well, some people would say it. I'm just saying. But well, he's gone from being a really good player to being a perennial MVP candidate to leading a team you know, almost to the NBA Finals to being one of the best players in the league because he saw holes in his game, and he's gotten better at those things. Friends, what would happen if we turned that same, that same view on our own Christian lives, on our, on our lives in general? What, I mean, what are the holes in your game? What are the holes in your family life? I mean, maybe, maybe, it's, um, maybe it's parenting. I mean, maybe you really, really want to pass on the content of the faith to your kids, but you're not even sure that you understand the content of the faith. So maybe you have a content gap that you need to, to work on and, and fix. Maybe you need to get into a grow group. Maybe you need to uh, come talk to me. Maybe you need to talk to somebody else. Maybe we need to get you involved in some sort of, uh, you know, s- something that will help with content pieces. That's what our Bible boot camp was for. That's what those kinds of things are for, is to help people with the content of their faith. Maybe th- you need to learn the content so you can pass on to your kids. Or maybe you're great on the content side. Like, maybe you get it. Like, you were raised in the church, man. You, you got all the content stuff but you're never home to teach your kids the content. Maybe that's the hole in your game. Maybe, maybe it's impatience, like sometimes it happens to me. Is I, it's not that I don't know the content of the faith. It's that sometimes when we have these conversations, I get impatient, and, and sometimes the, the, the content gets overshadowed by my personality or by what I say or how I say it. Maybe, maybe that's a hole in your game. I don't know what the hole is, but maybe it's time to fill it. Maybe the hole in your game is your knowledge of Scripture. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had, not only in this church, but every church I've ever served, where people will start a conversation with, uh, you know, I don't know the Bible that well, but. I'm not sure, chapter, verse, but. Doesn't God say, right? Or my prayer life's not really where I want it to be, right? I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people that start with those things. Well, maybe it's time to fill that gap. Maybe it's time to fill that hole. Maybe... If, if, if your scripture life looks like, hey, I get myself into trouble or something happens and, I say, and then I open up my Bible, I say, God, I need to hear a word from you. And so I'm going to open it up to this page, page 472. I'm going to take my finger, God, I'm going to point at whatever it is that I point at. And whatever it is I point at, I'm going to assume that you're talking to me, God. So I'm going to take my finger, I'm going to point it, and I'm just going to trust that you're talking to me. Really? Ready? Here we go. Boom. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Best two out of three, God. Best two out of three. All right, let's see what we got here, you know. If that's your scripture, I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the scriptures when bad things happen. You absolutely should go to the scriptures when bad things happen. Absolutely. And sometimes God could even speak to you in that way. Friends, what I am saying to you is that there's something more. There's something more. Maybe your prayer life is a, is a hole in your game. That's something I've always struggled with in my, in, my, uh, in my Christian life is just that regularity and remembering to pray rather than go solve the problem myself. 
maybe your prayer life is like mine was at one time where it was just like I, my prayer life it was pretty much meals and, and, and when I got horizontal in the evenings, right? When it was time for bed, I'd lay in bed and I would start and I'd be you know, tired and I'd be like, all right, God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for my family. Thank you. you always love and provide for us. Awesome God. And please forgive me. And then I'd wake up in the morning and my mouth would be wide open. I had this little bit of drool dripping off to the side, right? And what's the first thing you say when that happens, when you wake up in the morning and you, and you, you fell asleep in the middle of your prayer? The first thing you say is, amen. Because you thought you had God holding on all night long. Maybe that's your prayer life. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm not, if that's your only prayer life, don't stop doing that. I'm not saying that you should. There's something beautiful about falling asleep in the arms of Jesus at night. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what I am saying is that there's something more. Maybe that's a hole. Maybe that's a hole in your game, and maybe this is the time to do that, to, to fill that. So how, right? I, I want to leave you with some practical, just some practical stuff. Like, how do I do this? The first thing I think we can learn here is on how to fill a hole in our game is something we can learn from Apollos, and it is this. Adopt a, a posture of humility. Adopt a posture of humility. I want you to notice what happens here. Now, ladies, I didn't write the rules back then. This is not, this is not my thing. I'm just telling you that back then, uh, women were second and third class citizens in Jesus' day. That's one of the things that's so beautiful about the life and ministry of Jesus is that he changes that. He addresses and talks to and, and elevates the status and role of women. And even though certainly there are people who, who look, at, you know, they look at Paul's teachings, and yes, Paul says women should be silent in the churches in one particular part to one particular church. We also have to understand that Priscilla, the woman that I talked about earlier, the woman who is a contemporary of Paul, who is a partner of Paul, she's sent by Paul to go and to teach and to lead in churches. Priscilla is one of the reasons that in the Methodist church that we ordain women, one of the reasons we have an associate pastor who is female because, because it reminds us, she reminds us that, that women are uniquely gifted and called just as men are gifted and called. And so, but I want you to understand what happens here. Apollos, who is a man, who is a teacher, who is a learned, respected orator and, you know, evangelist, he allows Priscilla, this woman, and Aquila to instruct him, to teach him, to disciple him. And that's a beautiful thing. And the reason it happens is because they're willing to be bold enough to say, hey, can we tell you something? But even more importantly, it's because he is willing to say, speak into my life. I want to be humble enough to learn. I see now that I have a hole in my game. I want you to speak into my life. He adopts a posture of humility. Friends, that is so hard for us to do. It's so hard for me to do. But friends, if you want to fill a hole in your game, you have got to adopt a posture of humility. You have to be willing to let people speak into your life. The second thing I want to lift up to you that I think really helps us as we're trying to uh, fill a hole in, in, in our game, right? is to start where you are and move forward. Again, I want to be clear this morning that if your prayer life is laying down at night and falling asleep in the hands of Jesus, please do not stop doing that. I actually, when I was doing, uh, I was teaching at this camp in California that I told you guys about last week, there was, a, there was a girl in high school who was there, and I talked about that similar kind of thing, and she said afterwards, several years later, she came back to me, she said afterwards, she said, I realized that, you know, that was, I, I, that was all that was my whole prayer life and so I wanted to do something different but what I and so then I stopped praying at bedtime because I thought well that must be silly and so I started trying to pray other things but then that wasn't successful and you know what I ended up doing was I ended up not having a prayer life at all I said that's not what I was meant that's not what I meant it's not what I'm talking about I'm not saying ditch what you're doing I'm saying do what you're doing but realize that there's more if your scripture life is, is to point at a scripture in a really difficult time, then keep doing that. But friends, realize that there's more. There's more, there's more wisdom to be had. There's more context to be had. There's more help and interpretation and all those things to be had. 
if you engage the scriptures more deeply. I'm not saying stop what you're doing. I'm saying start where you are. That's okay. Where you are. God loves you right where you are. Stay where you are and then move forward. If you want to fill a hole in your game, don't, don't just scrap everything. Start where you are and move forward. Last thing is this. Be proactive in asking for what you need. Be proactive in asking for what you need. Sometimes that means asking your, your church family, right? I'm, I'm so, it's been so cool because I guess it was two weeks ago I talked about mentoring and how Paul mentored Timothy. In the last two weeks, I've had two or three people email me or contact me to say, I need a mentor. I need someone to walk me forward in my faith, asking me for help finding someone to help mentor them. Friends, that's a beautiful thing. You know why? Because that's a posture of humility. There's a place that I'm not yet that I want to go and I need someone to help me get there. And it's being proactive. It's saying, I want to get there and it's my job, right? It's my job. I'm not saying it's my job as the preacher. I'm saying it's your job and it's my job. I have to own my own spiritual growth and you have to own yours. Be proactive in what you need. Your church family is going to try, right? We're, we're going to offer very practical things. The Bible boot camp, again, was one of those. We're going to continue to do things and, 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 and learn what your needs are and try to address those to give you the right tools to do the things that, that God is needing you to do. But friends, you don't have to wait on us. There are other resources out there. There are other things out there. There's ways to be trained. Just be proactive in what you need. And if I can help you, please let me know. But, but be proactive in what you need. Friends, at the end of the day, we all have holes in our game, every single one of us, and there's not a single one of us who has arrived. If you think that you have arrived, I have news for you. None of us have arrived. We have a hole, we have a hole in our game. We have holes in our game. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Will we have the wisdom? Will we have the, the character? Will we have the humility to see the holes in our game? And then will we... Well, we have the courage to step towards something that will help make us be and become more of what God wants us to be. That's the question I have for me this morning. It's the question I have for you. What are the holes in your game? What are you going to do about it?